I was very remiss this morning because I didn't thank ESC as one of our major sponsors for today. So, um, hence my, my apologies for not putting up Sparks at, um, banner up. There is another ESC mapping um, banner outside and many thanks to Steve Gaducci for authorising uh, funding, which is paying for food. So, um, I hope you've all uh, felt it's worth the benefit. Um, so, Tim very kindly spoke last year and agreed to talk again this year. Score. Um, so, Tim has been with ESC Mapping and GIS for nine years and is part of a small development team utilising open source products to build bespoke solutions for organisations in Tasmania and across the country. ESC Mapping and GIS have experience in bringing projects to production and utilising open layers, map guide, leaflet, Postgres SQL. GeoMaster, Flask, and a collection of other open source tools. The company also has its own survey gear, including both fixed wing and rotated prop drones to take the quality of the data shown in their products to the next level. Tim's talk will be, to, uh, will be about creating sparks for agriculture and forest managers. Over to Tim. Thanks very much, Dawn, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, look, um, thanks for watching the introduction. I'm just going to get straight uh, straight into it, maybe give you guys a bit of a background as I, as I go through the talk. So I'm going to uh, be uh, looking back into the dark ages as a, a starting point for this presentation. We're going right back to the year 2010, um, a year of, uh, of frightful things like uh, Quantum GIS 1.6 and uh, Internet Explorer 6. Now, of course, there was Google Chrome around for a few years uh, by that point, and Firefox had been around for a few years more than that. However, if you were working in uh, government in Tasmania, there's a high chance that you were running a Windows XP computer with the default operating system, i.e. 6. Um, that'll give you that's some, some context for, for later. The question uh, that I want to um, ask now is, what did data management look like for many Tasmanian forestry and agriculture companies in 2010. Um, and S-Mapping have a, a bunch of people who uh, founded the company and, and uh, worked for the company who were in that industry around uh, this time or, or before that time. Um, and they'll tell you that it was things like Excel 2003, uh, ArcView 3, uh, or Notebooks. Uh, although if I had to choose between ArcView 3 and Notebooks, I might choose Notebooks actually. Um, and so um, these guys were struggling with tools that themselves were out of date for the year 2010, let alone uh, what was to, to come. And uh, in 2010, a group of these, um, these people from these industries who uh, just all happened to um, uh, be wanting to look for a change for various reasons, at similar times, this, uh, these guys formed a, uh, a company called S-Mapping GIS to um, serve the forestry and, uh, and ag industry. Um, and they said to themselves, maybe we can use our expect expertise to help improve the way these industries manage their data. And uh, one of the, uh, the founders of Best Mapping, Jeremy Wilson, had already been doing that um, previously. He created a, a tool called the Spatial Planning and Resource Query System, otherwise called uh, Sparks, which was actually fairly highly regarded in the industry, despite what it looked like. Um, uh, and ultimately, uh, it all boiled down to the fact that these guys were wanting to answer very particular problems. They were wanting to get very particular views of the data. And the Sparks tool was the way in which they um, achieved that in the way that, was, uh, that had the least amount of technical uh, knowledge required, that was the, uh, the fastest, and just got the job done for them in a way which would have been a lot harder had they just been starting with like a blank ArcView uh, window. So Sparks... Uh, was was highly regarded in the um, industry as a as a result. Um, so the question that S Mapping asked was, what do we need to do to help these guys? You know, the um, despite the Sparks extension for for ArcView, uh, they were utilizing notebooks and Excel spreadsheets. The data was all over the place. So so how do these guys get helped? Well, you start off by consolidating the data. You 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 know go to everybody's computers and go, what spreadsheets have you got that you feel like is like the best representation of, for example, the list of coops that you've got, or the areas, or the properties, or um, harvesting records, all that sort of thing. And you consolidate it, both the spatial data and also anything related to that data uh, as well. And then you get it into a spatial database. 
so that you can actually uh, maintain the integrity of that data so that you can retrieve it easily so that it can, you can have one point of truth for that data um, as well. And then you allow the data to be viewed and managed and edited and reported on um, by, uh, by looking into that spatial database and, and having particular uh, views of it, both spatially and, and tabular as well. And so S-Mapping wanted to achieve client satisfaction in the area whilst operating on the budget of a startup, <clears throat> which is what led them towards the option of free and, and open source. And um, it's a credit to, um, it's a credit really to um, some of the, the companies in the industry because, you know, um, it is a, a risk for them to back a company who are talking about building something more on their own terms and, and building off free and open source platforms rather than established commercial platforms. Um, some of the older people in the room will be familiar with a, a time in the past, say the 80s, where you had to d decide whether you were going to be buying a bunch of, say, IBM computers or buying a bunch of Macs. And the, uh, the saying at the time was nobody ever got fired for choosing IBM. And uh, in, the same, in the same vein, like nobody would probably get fired for choosing Esri as their, as their platform, but certainly it was a much higher a risk option going down, like um, uh, going with a company who were backing free and open source software as, as their platform. Um, and it was, it was riskier. But the benefits is what we had to, had to sell them on. And so in terms of what these uh, uh, platforms uh, were for actually getting this stuff done, um, it was decided that uh, PostgreSQL with, with PostGIS was the best um, uh, spatial database uh, available at the time. Open Layers 2, um, MapGuard with Fusion, and KPHP, all of which I'll um, speak a little bit about um, just, uh, just now. Um, so PostgreSQL and its PostGIS extension is um, uh, one of the best ways of, um, of storing us and indexing and uh, quickly uh, loading spatial data that's, uh, that's available in the, in the open world. Um, and then uh, CakePHP, uh, I'll talk about a, a bit more, but effectively it's an amazing way of taking a just a database view and actually um, doing a lot of the things, you know, creating a website with a lot of the things that you know you would need if it's all about data, uh, data management. So I'll talk about that more in a, in a sec. And then we've got um, MapGuard and, and OpenLayers. So MapGuard was uh, uh, built, with, uh, built on top of uh, Fusion and, and Open Layers. Open Layers was really the, the, the viewing engine for that. But um, Fusion combined with MapGuide would allow uh, people who say were non um, technical to be able to actually change um, the, um, the GIS. So uh, this MapGuide Maestro program, which is like a, a Windows program, would allow you to um, decide, say, for this particular web GIS for this client, which data was available, how that um, data was going to be um, shown. Um, when layers could be switched on or off, like which widgets were available. Like this client wants to measure widget, but this one doesn't. So we enable it for that one. And so all of these, um, these things were able to be managed within this interface, which actually meant that at a certain point, non-developers were actually able to manage these um, open uh, WebGIS um, uh, systems. Uh, so that was, that was a good horse to, to back for, for those reasons. Um, and so this is one of the this is a couple of screenshots of one of the implementations that we um, uh, that we co completed. And to go back to the stuff I was telling you about with with Cake, the idea with uh, Cake and its bakery is that you bring in all the data into this spatial database, like like PostGIS or PostGRE, uh, and you make it so that all of the data is ex you know exactly how you want it. You know, it's just chef's kiss, beautiful, perfectly aligned, perfectly related. And then as a result of running through the cake bakery, a web application or a website with full viewing, like data viewing and um, create and update and edit uh, functionality is all, um, is all built. So all of these um, pages, like this is obviously a, just a, a data view page, all of these pages get built just purely based on the, um, the database. And it will even go as far as uh, try to make the, the fields uh, across the top as human readable as possible. So like if you've written property underscore name in your database, it will just like get rid of the underscore and capitalize the P in the end and try and make it more uh, user, uh, you know, user friendly and, and human uh, readable. So that was like our starting point for how we took just a, um, just the client's data in the database and, and turned it actually into a website where they could actually see that data. Um, 
but then we started expanding on that as well. So you can see in the bottom right corner, there's like an export geometry button as well as a export grid to CSV. So we allowed them the opportunity to, you know, get back to what they had before where they liked things to be in Excel spreadsheets, but also like um, view data in ArcView or whatever um, other package that they, that they had. And then in terms of uh, interrogating this data, other than exporting it to CSV and doing whatever they want with it, within this interface, we just had a simple, um, a simple filter that we developed across the, the top. Um, and so this is what uh, MapGuide, one of the implementations of MapGuide looked like back in these next four or six days, as I was um, telling, you, uh, telling you about. But it's got a bunch of interesting uh, components uh, to it. So um, out of the box, you get like a, a particular layer control and you, uh, your properties area. You've got this toolbar across the top where you can switch on or off all the tools, that, any tools that you want for the client or that the client wants. And then you can actually develop your own tools as well. So you can go and like write JavaScript that does a particular thing uh, with the interface or with the data and create an icon for it and, and add it there as a, as a separate widget. And yeah, it went as far as doing some sort of geoprocessing and stuff, buffers and, and, and what have you. And this is sort of our implementation of, of MapGuide. So we, um, we made it look better. I'm not going to say it looked am, uh, um, uh, amazing, especially not by 2021 uh, standards. Um, but we, we spent uh, some time on making the interface more user friendly and building a lot of custom tools. So building on, on top of uh, what uh, open layers and, and Fusion and MapGuide could provide and uh, making tools that were specific to the industry, getting answering um, very particular questions and solving very particular problems for, for those clients. Um, and well, that was for, uh, I said those clients, but that was for one particular client. But then of course, we'd engage another one and we'd go ahead and build an interface that was similar, but not exactly the same. You know, we'd take a copy of all these things and we'd, uh, we'd build it with a new database structure because their, their structure was different. They had different terminology. Um, and so we have a, sim uh, a system where we were able to copy a lot of co parts, but actually in other um, areas, we, we had to sort of do some new work. And so there'd be new code created in there. And then another client would come along and we'd do the same thing uh, again. And, and maybe we had a, a new constraints there where there were new versions of reports and stuff. And so what we ended up is a situation where we had like multiple branches of this, um, of this platform. And some of them had features that other ones didn't. And we didn't do necessarily a great job of being able to bring features across. Sometimes a particular client would pay for a particular features. So the questions about, you know, um, whether they owned that or whether we were able to just um, share that around. So the company said, look, maintaining separate copies of a system is a nightmare. Can we unify them all with one modular system? And so the answer was, let's, yes, we probably can, and let's do it. And so the Sparks name was returned to because it was uh, held in such high regard by these guys from the, uh, from the 2000s in terms of the problems it was solving for them. Um, and uh, that's what we've started uh, developing. It's, it's been launched, but if you were to talk to the developers, they would say that they're not comfortable about um, uh, it being like being called uh, ready for action. Um, but uh, what I'm going to do now is go into uh, Sparks just for a, a couple of minutes and show you guys um, uh, what we've got. And um, look, this is a, a, a big caveat. Like I, I know that it's, um, there's elements of this that are, are not ready for uh, prime time. I'm going to show you anyway. But I figured that out of all of the audiences in um, Hobart where this would be acceptable to be able to demonstrate it, this is uh, this is it. Um, so. Uh, no, no, no. Well, what I'm thinking is that it's a compliment because you guys are going to be like, oh, yeah, I can see that that's bad, but I know that it would be good. And we understand why it doesn't look good and we understand why this is broken. Um, whereas, you know, if we were to demonstrate this in front of our potential clients and something was broken, then if it's the wrong thing, then that's like the difference between signing up and not signing up. Uh, and it has huge implications for us. So Sparks is going to be a subscription system. And the idea is, is that all of these clients we built these disparate, um, although very uh, interrelated apps for, would all go under this single um, platform. Uh, and that uh, we would build what well, we already have. We would continue to build modules in a way that made it easier for us to say, all right, well, you know, we've got the one code base. Uh, we only need to write everything once, but um, this client's got this very particular need, so we'll enable this module for that, um, for that client. Um, and uh, so we've, one of the things about um, Sparks is that, uh, or about the, what 
um, the forest industry in particular, um, one of the things that's unique to them is the fact that they sometimes care about um, very particular aspects of, um, of data. Um, and uh, also they, you know, they've got a lot of um, detail in terms of like going down to the coops uh, level. Um, and so things get complicated quite quickly. And so they actually need all of these layers um, uh, accessible to them at certain times, but they don't necessarily want very many of them uh, shown, uh, shown at once. So I'm just having a look uh, now. So just compared to when I uh, tested it uh, this morning, um, things are, are more broken because we're actually like, this is actually the development system um, right now. Um, but uh, basically, yeah, there's the, the opportunity to turn on all sorts of layers and also forest, uh, forest managers sometimes need to produce very particular uh, views of their data. They have um, requirements to say present a map uh, in a certain way for, you know, in regulatory requirements or um, uh, presenting to uh, particular um, agencies. So we've um, gone through and built a lot of the um, stuff that they, they would otherwise need to do manually in a, uh, in a GIS or more manually in a GIS and make it so that those layers all come on all at once and that they are arranged um, uh, correctly. Yeah, so um, a, few, a few other things like we've got a tabular system um, down here that's like another view of the, um, another view of the data. We've got a, um, a print area as well. And there's, um, uh, it's amazing how in these industries, forestry and ag, the idea of like a, a paper map is still actually very important to them. Um, uh, and so being able to actually uh, have uh, good control over, over those maps in terms of the, the wording on them and, and just like, I don't know, crazy things like the ability to say, move your, um, move your elements, change your, your logo or um, get data from the, the map as well. So some of this information here, obviously it says, my name there because it's loaded it from the database. And so getting as much of that in um, as intelligently as possible is, is really important to these guys. Um, yeah, so we've got a full sort of, um, a, a full builder you can, uh, for uh, maps within this interface. You can change the, the North Arrow, you can um, change the logo, you can change the, um, the base map. Um, yeah, and uh, make it so that only certain things appear in the legend, really customize that as well. Um, switch to an A3 view of, of the data. It's all, um, yeah, it, it's all important to, to, to these guys. So we've um, spent a bit of effort in actually that, that process and our plan is to not only allow people to be able to um, print these maps, obviously to, to their physical printer, but obviously create as a PDF and, and create as a spatial PDF as well, which is becoming more of a request where the PDF actually has spatial data embedded into it and that it would allow it to be viewed in, in particular systems that can, that can read that data. Um, yeah, I could go on for ages about Sparks, but uh, considering the bell just rang, I'm uh, gonna uh, just call it quits right there. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yes, stop. <laughs> uh, as in, uh, would it work on um, iPad and, and on mobile devices? Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so it will. <laughs> At the moment, um, the interface that's being built is just for the desktop, but yes, it will come as an app. That's a huge part of it. So, this is, I get thrust this is a delay on the delivery system, isn't it, rather than the data input system? Yeah, so. Um, I, I guess I didn't manage my time properly in terms of uh, explaining that stuff, but you can record operations against your, say, coops, um, for example, and so people can uh, say that this, the harvesting has occurred, this spray has occurred, all that sort of thing. So it is an import, sy import system as well. New um, data can be created in it. So um, a, a company could start with absolutely nothing and create all of their properties, their sands, their coops, and all their operations can be recorded in the system. Um, I'm just wondering, what is your, so, so you started with all these different kind of platforms that were very similar and you tried to make something more generic. Um, what is like your, what, what do you regret most about this? Like as far as, are there particular things that have that's made it really hard to do um, for particular clients or? Regret most about um, stuff pre-Sparks? Or no, with Sparks, like something new that you've done that you could have done differently. 
we're too early on to be able to tell you what we regret. I think. I need to ask the question of something. It's something quite interesting. Interested in from like a software architecture perspective or whatever, as far as turning all these different systems into a single thing, and obviously it's very complicated. Yeah. I think it's um something that you find is that uh, when you say determining which platforms you you're going to use, um, it's uh, you know that you're going to lose out in some areas and, and benefit in others. And so you're always going to at a certain point where you're like, oh, yeah, you know what, if we had used this other system, we would have gotten this benefit, which is now harder in this world. But that normally means that you've forgotten about the reasons why you picked this other one in the first place. Um, but that's a pretty generic answer to your specific questions. What's analytics you would need to it? So also look at historical stuff that these people that have worked in different areas with you um, and obviously the change over time. Yeah, um, great question. So, what sort of analytics is there? Um, I mean, yeah, we've, we're going to have some form of, um, of time component uh, within it. So, theoretically, people should be able to take a particular coup and um, get all of the information uh, reported on in, in sequence from when planting occurred to when harvesting has occurred to when the next um, plant occurs, the next harvest occurs, and analysis can be done between um, seasons on that. Uh, that's uh, some of that um, was available in our previous system. So, um, you know, one of the things about this is that there's like some of the heavy lifting and some of the, the hard thinking has already been done with our past systems. It's just a matter of bringing it across to, to this one. Um, but, uh, you know, we've got to do it under, under the new lens of let's make this more modular than we tried to last time because it didn't quite work out um, how we envisioned last time. Okay. Now, you could take that. Software tools, system you've created into another uh, area, like this is all done for forestry. You could do a combined for you know road management and everything. Um, what would you do? Would you rename it, or would you just rebrand it, spark something else, or are you are you considering metric to use it somewhere else? Yes, we can. I think that like a question that um, people would often ask is why use this system rather than other more generic systems that are that are available. Um, and our answer is that we allow you to solve your particular problems and have your particular business logic built into it. So if we were to say move into the mining sector, they've got all of these very specific problems again that we'd be trying to um, solve. Uh, and so there'd be a lot of energy involved in, in doing that. So um, 